Thank you very much. Uh, I slightly changed the title of my talk. Uh, it's still going to be roughly about what I said it was going to be, but as usual when you're preparing a talk, you actually go and read some new things and your thinking changes. Uh, and I read a, a book by a philosopher and it changed my thinking. Uh, uh, I should keep away from those philosophers. Uh, right, so this is going to be a, a very busy talk and I apologise for that. And I might skip some of the slides as I go through it because there's far too much material here. But uh, we'll see how we, how we do. Uh, so I want to bring together certain sorts of things in this talk. Uh, the notion of a self-memory system, I'll say what that is in a minute. Uh, I want to talk about a thing called the default or core network, which is very interesting uh, brain kind of discovery that's been made over the past 10 years. And then I want to talk about narrative thinking, and this is where uh, I read this book by this philosopher. Uh, and I want to talk about fictionalizing tendencies. But really I want to relate all of this to things that spontaneously occur in our thought and our memories, rather than anything that's kind of done deliberately. Uh, but we might say something about that too. Right? Uh, so the aim is to construct a cognitive neuroscience model of spontaneous everyday fictionalizations uh, in what I'm going to call narrative thinking. Uh, right, originally, we proposed this notion of a self-memory system many years ago now, actually, uh, uh, based upon a review of a wide range of literature in uh, neuroscience, uh, neuroimaging, which is just in its very infancy in those days, uh, and neuropsychology, uh, lots of experimental findings from the lab, uh, and uh, work from studying psychological illnesses such as schizophrenia. Schizophrenics have particularly interesting autobiographical memories, but there's not going to be time to talk about those this morning. Uh, it's important to note that in this, this kind of cognitive structure, the self-memory system, that memories are considered to be constructed. They're not reconstructed, they're constructed. Right? Uh, and that means that the memory is a product of lots of different types of knowledge uh, in the brain. Some of it conceptual, some of it episodic, and I'm going to say a bit more about all of that in a minute as well. Uh, because of this construction, it means that memories are, to some degree, always false. So when you remember the wonderful meal you had last night, you remember it in less than a minute. But the meal took five hours. So your memory is always time-compressed. In that sense, it's always false. And there'll be other parts of it that are false, too. Uh, rather than use the word false, I think I'm going to switch to using the word fictional because I think it captures more what I mean about memories having a kind of self-thematic uh, dimension to them. Uh, let's briefly consider the nature of this putative uh, memory system, uh, which consists of uh, episodic memory and conceptual knowledge. And we'll start by uh, looking at uh, episodic memories. So episodic memories, according to our uh, thinking, are uh, made up of uh, some episodic elements, and these would be uh, fragments of knowledge uh, relating to a particular time and place when you had some sort of experience, they won't be literal. They're always going to be processed through the brain. They're always going to be how the brain interpreted that experience. They're never going to be literal representations of the experience. But they can be uh, closer or farther away from that. And that's what we call this dimension correspondence co coherence. So an episodic memory might correspond to reality really quite well. Lots of people think, for example, that uh, in post-traumatic stress disorder, the memories that come out of that correspond to reality very closely. Uh, in fact, if you look at them, they do not. They're full of all sorts of fantasies and uh, strange bits of knowledge. Uh, but generally speaking, there'll be some memories that correspond more closely to reality than others. But reality can never be remembered. It can only be experienced, and you can only remember your experience. Uh, the other end of this dimension for episodic memories is what we call coherence. So a memory might be created and retained because it fits with the self or with some aspects of the self. And it doesn't matter too much whether it corresponds to reality or not. And for most of us, our memory systems lie three quarters of the way along this dimension towards the coherence end. And uh, I'll come back to a bit of that later on. Uh, Obviously, episodic memories can be complex. They don't have to be of one single moment in time. You know, you might remember the conference you went to last year. You might have several 
memories for that. And they all might be linked together into a more complicated knowledge structure. And indeed, if we look at the whole system, then it becomes really quite complicated in terms of the way knowledge is represented. So there is uh, conceptual knowledge, forms a large part of the system, right? what we call the conceptual self. Uh, and then are these little funny episodic memories that are shown down here, which look like uh, a lot of gravestones, but they're not meant to look like that. Uh, it's just indicating that these are probably in a different brain area and in a different memory system. Phylogenetically, uh, we think these might be earlier than the conceptual knowledge. So my cat, for example, probably has a fair few episodic memories, but she has no idea at all what's happening next week or what she did a month ago, because she doesn't have any of this conceptual uh, knowledge. Right, executive processes operate on this complicated <coughs> knowledge base. And I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but essentially what they do is they channel cues through the system. So you get a cue such as, uh, I don't know, seaside, bring a memory to mind, uh, and you get some information out of long-term memory. The executive processes say, well, this isn't the memory we're after. Let's uh, elaborate that a bit, put the cue back in the system and see what it comes up with now. So the executive processes have no direct access to the knowledge base but they can alter the cues that are used to probe it, and they can alter the information that becomes activated. Uh, and here's a little summary of the whole of this system, which I've taken from one of Pascal Pialino's papers, uh, which nicely summarizes it all in a slide. Uh, Pascal uh, did a, uh, and her colleagues did a wonderful bit of neuroimaging where they uh, basically found and isolated the neuro neurological basis of these different types of knowledge of episodic memories, details, specific events, general events, and uh, lifetime periods, as we call them. Unfortunately, when I was putting this talk together, I couldn't find her paper, so I couldn't steal the very nice uh, brain pictures that she has in it. And she refused to give them to me last night. So uh, there we go. Uh, so let's just briefly consider uh, the, uh, the response of someone in a keyword experiment to kind of illustrate what's going on here. So this person is a middle-aged man asked to recall a specific autobiographical memory to the word work. Now, the memory can be about anything. It just has to be prompted by the word work. And uh, this person says, right, I've got uh, an immediate image of my first pay packet. And that was my first job, and one in which we used to do a weekly stock take. And I remember the first stock take I did, January 1987, shouting out the orders that someone else took down and later collected my pay packet from the payment hatch. And he kind of worked in a sort of factory where you had a hatch that you went to and all the money was kept uh, behind there. Uh, you won't be able to read this overhead, but essentially it just maps out the conceptual and episodic information that was uh, in that memory. So uh, the image of the first pay packet is obviously episodic. Uh, this information, my first job, uh, one in which we used to weekly, do is weekly stock take, etc., uh, is all about conceptual knowledge and about the goals that uh, lie behind that. So essentially, nearly all memories take this form of conceptual uh, knowledge plus episodic memories. It's only for things like childhood memories that there's very little conceptual knowledge. So people will say, oh, I don't know, my earliest memory, I've got an image of sitting on a bench, there's a green field in front of me in a football, and that's all I remember. And the only conceptual knowledge is, this is one of my earliest memories. Uh, and uh, trauma memories uh, often lack much in the way of conceptual knowledge as well. Uh, so uh, when a memory is constructed, the brain imaging studies show that areas of the frontal lobes and posterior parts of the brain become highly active over the course of memory construction. They don't just light up immediately, it happens slowly uh, over a course of seconds. This is an EEG study. Uh, you don't really need to know all that much about it. I just wanted to have a look at this slide here. This is what's called a head plot, and the EEG electrodes are picking up activation uh, in the brain. This is the front part of the brain here. This is the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side. And so uh, this, is someone, this happens when someone's holding a specific memory in mind. So they've gone through a long process of retrieval, lots of activation happening in other areas while they construct the memory, and then they end up with a memory in mind, and this is the image we get across lots and lots of subjects. That is, a great deal of frontal activation, some of it on the left frontal lobe, some of it on the ventromedial frontal lobe, which is area that's known to be involved in processing self-relevant information, uh, and then activation spreading back uh, through uh, the, uh, probably in this case, through the temporal lobes, uh, perhaps uh, the pre the retrospinal areas at the back of the brain, and then 
Here will be the uh, visual areas, occipital uh, cortex, where visual images are coming to mind. So this person's going to have some conceptual knowledge in mind, which is probably related to these frontal networks, and then some episodic information related to the posterior networks. It's quite interesting. If you are unfortunate enough to suffer brain damage uh, to these posterior areas, then you may lose the power to generate visual images. And if that happens, you become amnesic as a secondary consequence. So you still have a memory, but it doesn't have any details in it, which is uh, an interesting fact, I think. Here's another summary of that. Uh, so from that EEG study, this is over many neuroimaging studies. It comes from the work of Roberta Cabeza and Peggy Jacks. Uh, and it's just mapping out some of the connected networks that emerge during the course of remembering a single memory, including emotion, which we'll say something about later on. The point I'm really trying to get to cross, across to you is that it's all much more complicated than it looks. It's not just episodic memories. It's a whole vast array of huge neuronal networks that come online when you're remembering. I sometimes say it's a bit like the brain breathing a memory. Right? It's not like picking something down off a shelf. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, recently, I mentioned earlier, there's been the discovery of this thing called the default or the core network. And this is a complex network as well, distributed through the neocortex and the limbic system and various hubs in the brain, such as the hippocampus. The default network is active when attention is not task-focused. So those of you who are sitting down there at the moment daydreaming about what you're going to be doing this evening, your default network is activated. Uh, and uh, it emerged, it was a discovery that was made serendipitously by accident because in the early neuroimaging studies in the 1990s, the control condition was do nothing. Just lie in the scanner and do nothing. Uh, and there was a strange assumption that you were just switching off your so you were just switching off your brain for a few minutes, and then you switch it back on because now you've got to do something. And they discovered, uh, to their amazement, that there was lots of activation taking place when people did nothing. Right? Uh, in fact, this is the activation that was taking place. So across these huge regions, this shows it nicely: frontal areas, posterior areas, temporal lobes. Right? Uh, Remarkably, uh, the default network is highly similar to the networks that underlie autobiographical remembering and imaging. And here's a, another study from uh, Schachter and uh, Buchner uh, showing uh, that this is activation in an autobiographical memory task. Uh, this is somebody imagining future events, plausible future events. You can see the activation is almost identical. Uh, and this is someone doing a theory of mind task. Again, the activation is highly similar. If you subtract the activations in these uh, maps from each other, then you're left with nothing, which means they're all showing the same thing, basically. Uh, but this shouldn't surprise us. After all, what do we do when we daydream? Well, we just think about the past. We think about the future. We think about our plans. We think about people we know. We indulge in what I'm going to call narrative thinking. And narrative thinking takes in remembering uh, and imagining. And uh, so now I want to focus on uh, this notion of narrative thinking, which comes from a philosopher called Peter Goldie, who was a, a professor of philosopher at Manchester University. He died a couple of years ago, and his last book was called Narrative Thinking, colon, The Mess Inside, which is a title I, I rather like. Uh, we shouldn't confuse narrative thinking with a public narrative, right? So what applies to a public narrative doesn't necessarily apply to narrative thinking. Right? Uh, OK, so let's look at some of the things Goldie has to say about a narrative. And then, uh, yeah, it's going to be time, we'll get to, a, get to a, a bit of data. We can, not data, but reports by people that are interesting. So he thinks there are three characteristics of narrative thinking. Uh, obviously, there are more than that, but three he picks out are coherence, meaningfulness, and evaluative and emotional uh, import. Uh, coherence occurs through the process of emplotment, which I think was a word invented by another philosopher called Ricoeur. You can see my knowledge of philosophy is limited. Uh, in fact, I was called a postmodernist last night. It was a real thrill. I've never had that before. <laughs> I don't even know what one is, but it was good. Uh, I'm going to put it on my CV. Uh, uh, so apparently this process of emplotment is uh, often 
and I can't even say this word, tatonement, it's a French word, you'll know what it means, I don't know what it means, but it means a gradual groping or construction or iterative shaping of a narrative. Uh, according to Ricoeur, employment extracts a configuration from a succession, and I like that quote because it captures really the way we think a lot about how memories are constructed uh, in the brain. So a list or a collection of items, uh, objects, emotions, events, whatever, is what employment, we would call it construction, turns into a narrative and gives it coherence. Meaningfulness uh, is interesting. Uh, uh, called, well, I think it is the way Goldie talks about it. So he talks about a narrative having an internal perspective. So uh, a narrative can become meaningful by revealing how thoughts, feelings, and actions of the people internal to the narrative could have made sense of them at the time. And this is really rather what happens, I think, when we're reading novels, etc. Uh, we're kind of being led by the author and by ourselves to uh, have an internal perspective on those characters. And perhaps the degree to which we have an internal perspective is the degree to which we then have some uh, emotion, vicarious emotion. If you want. Uh, on the other hand, meaningfulness might evolve from an external perspective. Uh, a narrative can be meaningful by revealing the narrator's external perspective. Uh, but internal and external perspective are interrelated, and the internal meaningfulness of a narrative, its emotional and evaluative uh, import, emerges because the narrative is the product of the external narrator. So we might think of the external narrator uh, as the frontal lobes uh, and uh, the content of the narrative as being in other brain regions, perhaps. I think this flickering backwards and forwards between internal and external perspectives is exactly what occurs uh, when we're constructing memories and narratively thinking about our lives when we're in default mode. So we're flickering around between external and internal perspectives on mental representations. Uh, and in uh, uh, memory research, we often talk about, and this came out in the talks yesterday, uh, memories having a feel perspective, that is, um, in a memory you have something like your original perspective, uh, or an observer perspective, in which case you see yourself uh, in the memory. Uh, and these may reflect these internal, external aspects of narratives. I'm, I, I'm happy to kind of go along with that a little bit. The trouble with field perspective is, if you say to somebody who's in your experiment, in your lab, you can, you know, what's your memory like? And so I'm just, it's like I'm there, it's like I'm seeing it. And then you're asking questions about things they should have been able to see, they typically can't answer them. So field perspective is a funny sort of thing. Uh, observer perspective is even madder. Right? So if you ask people what they look like in memories from long ago, they usually can't give you any answers. If you say to them, what were you wearing? You're seeing yourself in the memory. What clothes were you wearing? Well, they can't tell you. But they were wearing some clothes. I once said this to a radio uh, interviewer. It was a good laugh. I said, uh, tell me about a memory from recent times, you know, last couple of weeks. So I went to the pub with my friend two weeks ago. And we had a big conversation about this. And I said, well, what was he wearing? And he said, well, I've got no idea. And I said, but he was wearing something, wasn't he? <laughs> we hope. Uh, so your brain fills these things in for you. It's a bit like visual perception. You know, the brain makes up the visual world for, for you. Well, it makes up the world of the past as well to a great degree. Uh, whoops, gone the wrong way there. Sorry. Oh, what's happening here? Right, uh, very briefly, I'm only just say a brief word about the evaluative and emotional import. You can read Goldie's book if you want to know more. He has a very, very good chapter on grief uh, where he applies his notion of narrative thinking. It's really well worth reading, actually. Uh, I mean, his point is that things matter to people, <laughs> and a narrative captures the way in which things matter. Uh, uh, and importantly, as someone who is uh, internal to a narrative can simultaneously be external to it. So that's a bit like what happens in autobiography. It's a bit like what happens in autobiographical memory. So my suggestion is that when we're uh, in default mode, we're engaging in narrative thinking and creating coherent, meaningful, evaluative, and emotional mental representations. Uh, and these will include conceptual autobiographical knowledge, uh, some episodic memories, some memories of future events, your plans, uh, as well as imaginings of how the past might have been, wishes uh, and emotions. Uh, while narratively thinking, we oscillate between internal and external perspectives, creating narratives that have both experiential, wishful, 
from critical aspects uh, to them. Sometimes these narratives uh, become memories themselves or are experienced as memories. Maybe we have the same narrative that we're going over again and again in our minds. Eventually we forget about it. Some years later it comes back to mind and now we think it's a memory. This is how fictional memories uh, perhaps come about. And that's because possibly they're generated in the same brain regions as actual memories. Uh, Goldie talks about fictionalizing tendencies, and this is a concept that I particularly like. So he argues that we have a tendency to structure our autobiogra autobiographical narratives uh, in a way that's close to fictional narratives. I actually think it's the other way around, that fictional narratives are created uh, based upon our memories uh, or the structure of our memories. Uh, whatever the case, we all have a story, and there's been a lot of work in recent years by uh, Tillman Hebsmas in Germany and his colleague Susan Bluck uh, looking at the life story, uh, and that work's interesting because it is a very narrative sort of thing. Also, it has a developmental aspect to it, so if you say to a 10-year-old, what's your life story, they'll just look at you like you're a bit insane. If you say to a 20-year-old, uh, what's your life story, they'll happily bore you for the next two hours. So... Uh, <laughs> It's a developmental thing. Uh, Goli uh, identifies four main fictional tendencies. We plot our lives, that's the life story. We find agency uh, where there is none. Causal explanations are generated <laughs> in narrative thinking. Uh, there's a desire for uh, a narrative to have, have coherence and for it to have closure as well, even though it may not in real life. And one aspect of fictionalizing tendencies I particularly like is to do with genre and character, right, that influence our interpretations, expectations, and indeed our memories. So in fiction, it's not open to the brave hero of the novel to also be a coward, unless special narrative devices are introduced. And perhaps that's true in our memories as well. You know, that uh, fantastic, supportive uh, father you remember obviously couldn't do anything wrong. There are no memories of him getting it wrong. Right, let's look at some uh, data on this. First of all, I'm going to look at a little bit of data on confabulation, uh, what Maurice Moskovich called honest lies, which I think is a very uh, nice term. Uh, this is a patient of ours uh, called OP. In neuropsychology, patients are always known by initials, not their own initials, just initials. God knows why, but it's part of the fictionalizing tendency of uh, neuropsychology. Uh, she came to light because after having a very uh, nasty road traffic accident, uh, her family complained that she now lied all the time. In particular, she lied about uh, her grandson and uh, built up a, a, a kind of a world based on false memories, fictional memories, of a wonderful past family life. When in fact, she was living in terribly difficult circumstance and her past life had been pretty appalling as well. And her grandson, uh, I worked with OP when she was in Bristol, her grandson, who I met, was a Bristol slob. Uh, but in her memories, he's this wonderful, supportive young lad who comes out to see her all the time, which he never did. Uh, another patient, uh, A.O., uh, suffered right frontal damage, uh, and that often gives rise to paranoid confabulations and denial of their physical disability. So you'll ask them if they can walk, and they say, of course I can walk. And they say, well, you know, can you stand up? And so, oh, no, the nurse always gives me this chair, and I, she knows I can't stand up out of this chair. So uh, they're in a kind of denial about their injuries. Uh, her paranoid fantasies or confabulations often centred on memories of the nursing staff who she remembered moving her room at night, taking money from her, etc. These patients have sleep, uh, disturbed sleep patterns and they often wake in the morning uh, remembering of waking up in the night in a different room. All right. so they have a false memory of where they slept. Uh, she also had some positive uh, memories and she repeatedly recalled going walking in the very recent past in her childhood in a village in Scotland. Well, she wasn't in Scotland and she can't walk, so they're obviously fictional. Her confabulations seem to be attempts to make sense, as confabulations often do, to make a narrative of a very difficult present situation. And her physical injuries were attributed to nursing staff, giving her difficult chairs, etc., keeping her permanently tired by moving her room every night. Uh, and these memories seem to have an external perspective to them. Right? Whereas the memories of walking in her village in Scotland gave her a lot of comfort, right, and seemed to have more of an internal perspective. They're more like field memories, if you want. She sees this, the village and she's walking through it. Uh, one possibility is that internal perspectives in narrative thinking uh, 
generally induce positive emotions, but obviously not in the case of traumatic memories. Uh, external perspective, on the other hand, uh, might more generally produce negative and more praising emotions. In both cases, the perspectives and emotions are based on narrative thought, and that is to some degree more or less fictionalised. Uh, very quickly, have a quick look at some childhood memories. So we've collected thousands of these. Uh, we'll get to ours in a minute. There's been some very recent studies on what are called uh, unbelieved memories. So it turns out that lots of people have memories, from, particularly from childhood, which they believe to be memories, but which they doubt are memories of anything that ever really happened. So uh, they're often associated with negative affect as well. So probably with an external perspective. So the person sees themselves in their childhood memory. Childhood memories tend to have more observer than field perspective in any case. Uh, so I just said that's good. Uh, my favourite uh, unbelieved memory is a memory a man had of being in the park with his mother watching dinosaurs walking across a hill in the distance, which he obviously knew wasn't the memory, uh, but nonetheless he had it as a memory. Uh, here's an example of a fictionalised memory, a false memory from childhood. I'll read it out. A middle-aged man recalled his father distracting him when he was a young boy, about four years old, by asking him who was the first man on the moon. He had been intensely interested in the moon landing when he was a young boy, and this incident occurred while his father was on the telephone to his mother, who'd just given birth to his younger brother. Uh, in those days, uh, fathers weren't allowed in hospitals, as you probably know, uh, maternity hospitals. Uh, he had uh, a vivid and fond memory of his father placating him in this way, and he was highly agitated by the birth, so negative emotions. And in his memory, he could see his father on the phone and almost hear his voice. And it was only actually when I was giving a talk uh, that he realised that his brother had been born in 1968, one year before the moon landing. Possibly some event like this had happened later and had just been misplaced in time. But it's a nice example of a fictionalised memory that fits a particular genre, the genre being the uh, character of the caring father. So having a supportive uh, father... Uh, uh, these childhood memories often seem subject to fictionalising tendencies of genre and character. The good parent is always good, or at least they remember that way, and the bad parent is always bad and remembered that way. Uh, probably the most extreme example of these are to be found in uh, adult recollections of childhood sexual abuse. And actually, uh, because I haven't really got that much time, I'm going to skip over this bit, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, later if you want. Uh, right, uh, I'll skip that one as well. Right, uh, let's just uh, quickly go through. This is a frontal lobe patient who not only confabulates the past, but also confabulates the future. So his uh, future memories are things like, uh, to the word garden, he would say, I own a garden on the moon and all the other planets. And I will have them on all the planets, and I will grow plants indigenous to the planets. Or in response to the word mountain, he said, I will buy Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Fuji uh, and rent them out. If Sir Anthony Hopkins can own Snowdon, which is a mountain in Wales, and Sean Connery can own Ben Nevis, a mountain in Scotland, I can own Kilimanjaro. Uh, all right, so I want to close very briefly by just considering one of the great sources of fictionalised memories. Uh, and that is the politicians. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll just mention a few here that are interesting. Ronald Reagan uh, had a famous memory of presenting uh, a World War II soldier with a Medal of Honour. Uh, in fact, his memory was uh, word for word taken from a film called A Wing and a Prayer. And when it was pointed out to him, he never believed it. He still believed that he'd given this medal to this, uh, this soldier. Uh, Hillary Clinton had a famous memory of a trip to Bosnia where uh, the uh, helicopter landed, they jumped out, they had flat jackets on, it crouched down, ran across to this armoured vehicle and drove at high speed, where the actual uh, newsreel showed that they landed in a rather flashy aeroplane, they all came down dressed up in their best clothes and got in a huge limousine and were driven off sedately. <laughs> and she, she did a great thing, because this was pointed out to her that her memory was false, and she said, come on, I'm just human. <laughs> I thought it was a good reply. Uh, 
Bush's famous memory of seeing uh, the plane, uh, the first plane to hit the tower. As you will all know, he was actually in a school at the time and couldn't possibly have seen it, if you've seen uh, that movie. Uh, Tony Blair uh, had a famous memory of watching a, a very famous uh, 1940s footballer in England called Jackie Milburn playing for Newcastle United, which is where Blair's you know, uh, area was for uh, voting. Uh, in fact, uh, Milburn retired before Blair was born. Uh, Mitt, uh, Mitt Romney had a recollection of attending a golden jubilee marking the 50th anniversary of the automobile industry, which in fact took place nine months before he was born. Uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger remembered being inspired to enter politics after watching the Nixon-Humphrey presidential TV debate in 1968, uh, which in fact was not televised. <laughs> And there are many more. Uh, I collect these memories, actually, so if you've got any, uh, send them to me at that, this address. Right. And I'll credit you. Right, I'll just get to the end of this. Uh, these false memories of politicians invariably link them into their societies, communities, and cultural histories in a way that portray themselves uh, in ways that they, they clearly believe are appealing to voters. All right. Politicians seem to <coughs> fully believe in their fictional narratives and are happy to relate them, despite the fact they must know that the journalists are going to immediately check them out. Uh, when one can tell these fictional uh, memories often seem to have a field or an intel perspective, so no doubt they are comforting too. So they have a, a, maybe a, a nice feel to them for them. Okay, uh, false or fictional autobiographical memories often support what we might term a self-narrative, a part of the self-memory system. They're generated in the same brain networks as autobiographical memories. In this respect, they are not unlike true autobiographical memories, if there's such a thing. Uh, they allow us to have cells that have a consistent and meaningful, i.e. a coherent relationship with the past uh, and with the future, even if some or all of the narrative is fictional. Thank you. Thank you.